Time now for the leadership forum, and as usual, we are tag teaming with one Laban Cliff on Syria. Laban, I hope you don't have any analysts today. The president himself <laughs> says he's tired of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really true because, Trevor, I think we, it's about time we really changed the conversation and, you know, moved into a bit uh, of more perhaps maybe business ethics or maybe and leadership. Yeah. And that's exactly what we'll be talking about today. But uh, indeed, Trevor, it's, it's being a Friday and, of course, coming, uh, coming to a soft landing, the week coming to a soft landing. We're just going to be focusing a lot more on the events happening during the week and just talking about ethics and leadership. But from where you see it, Trevor, what, 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 how, do you, how do you understand ethics? What, what, do you, what, what really comes to your oh, mind? Oh, now, that ethics? is being put on the spot, right? Live TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anything we say, Laban can always be used against us. But here's the thing. First of all, for me, ethics sort of relates to your conscience, number one. You have to do the right thing at the right time, even if it's different. Difficult. Sometimes that there's a balance where one thing that the right thing may cross the other person, but mm -hmm. you have to do it either way. However, I know you have a professor in the house, so we we'll get an explanation of what the ethics really uh, don't is. Worry, but I know you're most of the time, the problem is it's ethics and integrity is just in the constitution. It's as good as the paper it's written on, but we don't see it. We don't see it in practice much. I'm happy that you've mentioned it, that it's just uh, in the Constitution. So we're just kind of moving from just the writing and the words and what you taught in school to actually exactly how do you really apply it uh, in your work, in your business, in your family. And that's exactly what we'll be uh, focusing on uh, today. So Trevor, I'm going to struggle just uh, kind of uh, uh, removing my hat as a business <laughs> journalist and now moving into kind of being this, uh, I don't want to use the word analyst. <laughs> don't, <laughs> at least not today. <laughs> uh, now let me say that this kind of uh, facilitator in this discussion just for the next few minutes. But Trevor, thank you very much for All handing right. it over to me. I have a, an expert panel in studio, as uh, Trevor mentioned. Uh, I'm going to introduce them really quickly, but uh, to just give, also give you an overview of what we'll be discussing, just really look at ethics and leadership. And uh, indeed, everyone who's here, perhaps either they have uh, uh, been fettered for being an ethical leader or they're actually inculcating ethics in their uh, ways of business, uh, also they're teaching ethics. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce right from the far left, we have Tim Kirui. Tim Kirui is the national coordinator of the Ethical Leadership Networks at in brief Elnet. Mm -hmm. Next to team, we have honored, yes, to be with the professor himself. That's Charles Samford, who's the ethical professor from uh, Griffith University. Most welcome to Kenya, actually, even to our studio and to Kenya. We we're happy that we uh, got him before he flies out <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, next to Prof, we have uh, Faisal Said, he's not new to the studio, of course. Uh, Faisal is the CEO of the First Community Banks, if we put FCB. Um, he's here to just tell us exactly how you inculcate ethics in business. And uh, a man who's not new to business and an engineer himself is uh, Peter Njeru. Peter Njeru is um, the 2016 Ethical Leader Award winner. That's under Elnet. And that's more reason why he's here. But uh, most of you will recognize his face because um, he's also the managing director of River Petroleum and now headquartered in Nairobi. And a lot more that also has been chairman of the petroleum um, kind of network of uh, pet petroleum uh, industry, industry, industries uh, right here in the country. So, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, yeah. for really uh, breathing the cold and being here on time. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And um, just as Trevor mentioned, really, this, this definition of ethics really becomes so difficult to kind of really get it, especially across board. And... Uh, Allow us to move in from the tower of knowledge. Yeah. And Prof, I'm going to just uh, come directly to you. How do you define ethics to your students? For me, ethics involves, involves asking hard questions about your values, giving honest and public answers, and living by them. If you do, you have integrity. If you don't, the first person you cheat is yourself because you're not the person you represented to yourself and the world that you are. But one thing that's really important in this is that it's not just about individual integrity. I think just as important is what we talk about institutional ethics and integrity. And institutional ethics involves an institution, whether it be a corporation, a government agency, a cabinet, a party, to ask those same questions. Uh, ask hard questions about their values give honest and public answers and living by them. Now, of course, that's a different process for an institution. It's built, you know, it requires a leader to ask those questions, to bring in, bring in the members to think about it, and then, of course, how you actually implement it. But essentially, institutional individual integrity are both necessary and both mutually reinforcing, and they have that same logical structure of asking hard questions about your values, giving honest and public answers, and living by them. All right, let's hear from Tim, from Elnet. How Thank do you, you find ethics even in the, the work that you do? Thank you. I, I keep it a lot simpler than Prof here. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down for us. Uh -huh. I'll build on what Trevor said, yes. doing the right thing at the right time. Uh -huh. But I, I add another tool. You know, uh, doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, mm -hmm. 
and for the right motivation or yeah. for the right reason. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes, uh, you know, we can be seen to do the right thing, but mm -hmm. maybe for the wrong motivation. So I think it comes also to the heart issue, which maybe ties with integrity. Mm -hmm. Why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. um, are you doing it also at the right time and in the right way? Mm -hmm. Again, you know, can get things done, but maybe not quite, you know, follow due process and so on. So doing the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right reason. All right, great. Let's move over to uh, Faisal. And uh, feel free to, I, I know you're Muslim also in your belief. Yes. Uh, yes. How do you also define this uh, in your uh, community? I think um, from an Islamic perspective, I mean, the laws are very clear in terms of being fair, being just, um, in not only to individuals, but to society at large. And, um, you know, through the organization, that's what permeates and that's what we, we want to live by. So many a times, and I think when you get caught up in society, um, um, one tends to stray, I think, um, and there must be methods or ways of how do you want to implement these things. And many other times, and, I, and we'll talk about that, is what we did in First Community Bank to, to get people to be conscious of what you do um, and take away individual um, decision making, rather collective decision making, so that you could see things from different aspects and different perspectives that, that people bring into, into the workplace. And as a leader, you want to then show, okay, if this is what we're going to do, this is how we think we should do it, we listen to everyone, and then you start changing, I think, the culture of an organization, and then you change the culture of a society that will be able to say, we want to do something that's good, not only for me, not only for the organization, but for society at large. You know why it's so critical to actually have, as said, especially in a banking yes, situation? Absolutely. And we're going to come to that story, of course, what has been trending on the news right now is what happened in, in uh, uh, Thicker Road. Of course, you're not speaking on behalf of KCB, <laughs> but it's just the whole need to have um, ethics inculcated in such you know, areas where you're handling such huge amounts of uh, money and of course there's a lot more that is expected of you. But we're going to come to that of course Excellent. and I want to get the panel uh, to react to some of these happenings during the week. Uh, Engineer Pichinjaru, wh when you receive this award and when you're recognized of being the 2016 ethical leader, um, what, what dawned on you or was it like, oh I'm used to this? Yeah, thank you very much Laban. When we were invited to do an assessment by Elnet, it was an element of what do you do in River Petroleum? How do you handle business? And when we received the award, the fact was it was an award for the company and for myself as a managing director. But the feel was, have we been fair to our customers, to our employees, to our suppliers, and to our service providers? And it was a feeling that it has been checked and observed that as an organization, we have dealt with business ethically. Our business is basically petroleum distribution and selling of retail outlets. So we have always believed that as a company, we should give fairness. And part of that comes from biblical principles that you should not have more than one measure for different people. You should not have unfair tackle when you are fighting, and that can be found somewhere in Deuteronomy 25, 15, where even if two men are fighting and the wife of one of them comes to separate them, she should not do an unfair tackle <laughs> to one of the men. Yes. And I think it's a bit seditious on the scripture there, 25, 14. Yes. She should not do an, an handling of an unfair part of the body <laughs> where she is trying to help her husband out. Yes. When you are carrying weights, when you are measuring quantities, you should do it fairly. And I think that is what uh, the award is all about. And that's what we practice. It, it, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that because, uh, I mean, this is petroleum. Mm -hmm. And we've uh, written stories about cartels in the industry and you having to either comply or not comply. You mm -hmm. know, how's it been for you? Uh, it's been good in many ways because we have marketed ourselves as a company that delivers what they promise. And for that reason, those who know us have consistently uh, purchased and invited others to become our customers. It's been difficult in other areas because there are people who produce or do or deliver or supply unfair business practices. This is in product quality and quantity. 
and of course there are other challenges. All right. Let's go to back to Elnet and the uh, team why I want sure. to bring you up on board is because you ha recently had awards yes. and you're actually recognizing different, mm -hmm. you know, uh, industries, different players who yes. really managed to come up front. H sure. How do you come to your listing? That's good. Maybe first of all, why we even got into this mm -hmm. is because we realize that Kenya has, of course, a huge challenge with corruption. And we thought, how can we best tackle this? You no, know, we could begin by you know, thinking about uh, maybe the, you know, trying to talk a lot about corruption. We don't think that would take the story you know, away or take away the problem. We thought, why don't we do the opposite? We unveil, uh, through a scientific process, people whose business conduct, personal conduct as leaders is ethical. Because then it begins to challenge us as Kenyans to realize that corruption is not inevitable. Because I think the way it's go we've gotten to is where people, it's so institutionalized that people think you can't do without it. It's, it's a fact of life. This is Kenya. How else can you do business, for example? So we wanted to, to identify people who are ethical and who begin to now be a role models also to explain it to our young people. Uh, we have had, we, so far we have 17 uh, people who have gone through this assessment and 16 businesses, Kenyan businesses. Some of them turning over billions of shillings in this country without ever, you know, bending the rules, paying taxes, you know, being fair to their workers, as I said, you know, paying, being fair to the customers. You know, some of them have paid a huge price. When they make a mistake, they own it up and pay back and things like that. So we wanted to show that it is possible to live differently. Mm -hmm. It is possible to succeed in Kenya mm -hmm. without cutting corners. Mm -hmm. That was our biggest message. And I think we are beginning to have that space now to show, showcase these people as role models, mm -hmm. like Engineer Njeru and 16 others, as well as 16 businesses. All right. Professor Sanford, why it's so critical to have you on board is because um, this is always taught in schools. Yeah. You know, it's uh, in universities and there. And I know you're also visiting as an adjunct, uh, adjunct lecturer at the Strathmore Law School. And uh, I mean, you pass on the information to them that this is how you're going to be ethical. This is what you're going to do. But when you get out into the real world is where now the, the, the real deal is. And that's now what Tim is talking about, that perhaps maybe what is written or what is taught doesn't become practical. <clears throat> I think that... Uh there are some people who think just teach people ethics from the age they're six and by the time they're, by the time they're 40 and they're running major companies, then it'll all be fine. Uh, I think that uh, the young people uh, I deal with and uh, as, as students are generally highly ethical and highly committed and even prepared to take big risks to uh, improve the society they're entering. It is, of course, the institutions that they're entering. And so whereas I think that it's very important to have idealistic, committed young people entering institutions, you really need uh, a combination of leadership within it. Uh, and I think that this is where the, what you're doing is really important because it's not just about stopping corruption. Mm. If, we, if, you, if you wanted to stop corporate corruption overnight, you could. No corporations. If you want to stop government corruption overnight, you could. Uh, you ju just don't have government. Uh, and whereas some anarchists might like that, most of us actually want government to do things. We want corporations to mm -hmm. deliver what they can. And that's why it's important to look at this positive side, mm -hmm. what it is you're trying to achieve mm -hmm. rather than what you're stopping, trying to stop. Because some people think that, well, we want to raise standards of behaviour, so we'll just criminalise mm -hmm. uh, more and more sort of petty crimes. Yeah. But what you're doing, I think, is really important Thank because you. you're in say, this is the ideal mm -hmm. that you are... Uh, uh, seeking mm -hmm. and it's possible which yeah, I think is really achievable. important mm -hmm. and you have those exemplars and it's mm -hmm. what I call it an ethical pool mm -hmm. as well as of a legal and economic yeah, push at the sure. other end. All right uh, let's talk about Griffith I want to stay there because um, uh, apart from being at Griffith I know you've had also a kind of a stint at the University of Oxford mm -hmm. and uh, what, what's the world's best what's what's the world's best practice what, what can Kenya maybe compare or match up to into you know countries that have managed to really inculcate ethical standards uh, in their ways of doing business uh, and what have you? Uh, two things I want to say. Firstly, that no country is perfect. Uh, and secondly, that uh, the perfect system in one country may not be the perfect system in another. But I think one of the global exemplars is actually not, uh, not Australia, but actually the state that, um, uh, of Queensland, which actually was by far the most corrupt state in, uh, in Australia, uh, leading up into the 1970s and 1980s. But after a major corruption inquiry, they uh, engaged in, in a comprehensive governance reform program. And it wasn't just uh, the Hong Kong model of a strong ICAC and a strong anti-corruption law. Rather, it looked at every single element of government, all the institutions, all the, all the key laws, and looked at uh, what are its strengths, what are its weaknesses, what do other countries do but not import it wholesale, but just see what, what, 
what the, uh, the others are doing that might help fill gaps and improve the governance in Queensland. And this particular approach was called, uh, I called it an ethics uh, regime, the OECD called it an ethics infrastructure, and Transparency International came and said, yeah, this is this is different and this is better, and they called it a national integrity system. So I think that all countries that uh, want to deal with corruption and promote integrity need to actually have a suite of reforms that reform their institutions and fit with them. And so it's not a question of a perfect model, but a, a very good mechanism for governance reform. And you look at every element of governance uh, and then you look, try to create a set of institutions which are mutually supportive to build integrity, but which there's sufficient collaboration that if one of them goes rogue, you know, if your ombudsman or your chief of police goes rogue, the others are working closely with them and will see it and will be able to check them. All right. Result, why it's so yes. critical also is, uh, I mean, we have this in the Constitution, it's there, it's written out, uh, you know, and we actually expect <laughs> every leader or every civil servant to actually to have this. Um, why, are we, why is it so hard to uh, kind of, you know, move it up from just the, the written word into now the, the practicality of it? Uh, I think, um, you know, Prof and I have been chatting outside, and there's, there's a number of factors, but I think if you look at Kenya, itself, um, for me, two big issues come about. One is um, there's a quick uh, get-rich-quick scheme, uh, and that um, exacerbates the issue of non-compliance. And two, I think economic development, which is um, slower than the pace of what people are demanding, and I think more and more the younger people are going to demand more. And you know, when you put these two things together, it's like, you know, how do you eradicate poverty? Uh, and the question that I pose all the time, if your kid was sick and being hospitalized, what do you do? So we need to have proper social networks. We need to have uh, nets that can cater for, 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 for the poorer people. And then I think uh, that base uh, would be able to sustain itself into the next uh, level. Mm -hmm. And uh, having open and fair um, economic opportunities and although we in Kenya we kind of call it it's open and fair but we know that um, some of the things are already done behind the scenes so that um, you know it, it seems to be fair but you, you would find uh, more and more of the same people getting the same kind of jobs uh, which is a problem the other problem is that um, uh, the the entrepreneur who wants to really um, progress um, may have great ideas. I think we we don't have um, proper systems, and and that goes through the whole um, uh, system where uh, our professionals as well. I mean, your auditors, your 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 your, your police, your your people that will put checks and balances are also within the system that's creating these problems. And a typical example is if you come from a banking side. People would come for assistance to the bank, and, and banks are there to help people so that you can grow the economy and create these kind of thing, uh, jobs for, for the economy. Typical thing is somebody is doctoring the, the financials. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a cost. Uh, it's a cost to uh, an organization like a bank where we have to check and we have to double check. And that cost has to be borne by somebody else because obviously it's a, it's a, it's a company that has to be making money. And it's these kind of issues that I think, these little issues that I think if collectively we, we, we bring this together, like Prof says, it's not only a legal thing, it's not only an institutional thing, I think it's uh, much more than that. And I think once we start implementing these things in individual organizations, hopefully I think we'll be better off. Right. Engineer Jerry, why uh, also, because uh, it's, it's one thing, uh, of course, to be an award winner, but I'm, I'm just looking at inculcating it in the organization and really ensuring that you can do that. So that's one question. How do you really inculcate from right from your level as a founder and managing director? But at the same time, also in the community, it will be like, uh, well, you're the ethical leader, but uh, well, you're not willing to cut deals. You're not willing to push on the uh, underside envelopes. That means now, you know, you're not going to make profits, but you exist as a business to make profits. Yeah, thank you, Raban. When it comes to inculcating, I think the basic thing is to start with the right morals. And the right morals can only be achieved by getting people who believe in what I am trying to achieve as an organization leader. This means 
our policies, our business principles, our vision and mission, our motto, we deliver quality, starts off at that level. How do you inculcate it in individuals? Somebody is in marketing. As a company, we tell them, we do not go for tenders by bribing the people who are wanting the tender. We compete, and if we are wanted, we are wanted because we have the right quality, the right quantities, and the right price. We encourage our HR manager, for example. We employ because of the qualities of the person. We don't expect people to be from a certain community, to be from a certain, uh, uh, who speak a certain, a certain way. And uh, we, we, we basically go through that by becoming serious about the moral values of our staff. And uh, of course, if anybody cannot toe the line and do the work in a straightforward manner, then we have no business doing it together. Mm -hmm. In community, I would say that in the wider scope, and this is in our country, I think morality is what gives birth to good ethical practices. And I would say that the biggest thing is to give an example to people that it's possible to do something without having to cut corners. Where does it come from? Worldwide, there are so many issues, cheating in schools drugs for athletes, different measures by traders, poor quality products by manufacturers. People have to decide that we have to deliver what we say. And that is the slogan we use in our company. And that's how we inculcate the, the, the thinking that when I tell you I'll give you this, let me give you that. Because my promise, you can take it as such. Team, uh, just before, yes. of course, we move on to uh, sure. break. But uh, mm. fr from Elnit's perspective, yes. um, is is uh, how is it starting? Because you know, uh, was it hard identifying <laughs> Thank you. leaders, the Thank awards? You. you know, even just looking at, <laughs> yeah. um, kind of just even because you'd have a conference before that. Yes, just yes. actually just talk about yeah, sure. um, ethics before. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we first, I, I need to give credit to the International Leadership Foundation is an organization that teaches leadership but from a values perspective and, and one of the sessions is on moral values. So that helped the leaders to begin to see that uh, this is foundational to bringing change. And uh, it is when now the leaders who went through that training, some of them are from the business sector felt, no, we must tackle the biggest issue. In fact, uh, I was up, I happened to be part of the training team and I thought that uh, maybe the biggest issue they'll deal with is maybe access to credit. You know, a number of years ago that was difficult. You know, uh, of course, I know this is a big issue that the banking <laughs> sector is dealing with True. from Fazil's point of view. But I thought, they told me, no, 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 our biggest challenge is not access to credit. It is corruption because it adds yeah. the cost of doing business. In fact, at the time, they were estimating, maybe that's around 2009, that uh, maybe up to somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of every transaction, you know, is, is uh, rather, you know, of, of it, you know, is made higher by corruption. So they thought if we can do this, we'll level the playing field, we'll increase, you know, even access to credit and other things because they're all affected. This was a, a bit of a journey. We first of all started with a, with a survey that we did among uh, 15 uh, top CEOs, many of them blue chip companies in this country. And wanted to ask the CEOs, how does it feel like to try and pursue, you know, the whole question of ethics in business? Many of them said it was very lonely. And uh, they felt like they were the only ones in their industry because they were from diverse industries, you know, that they were the only one voice that was trying to do it. In fact, they felt that they were sometimes even isolated by fellow CEOs because they are stopping their, their networks. You know, they are, they are disturbing the system that everyone is, has been enjoying so far. Mm -hmm. So we thought these leaders also need a support system. So we began actually a, a monthly forum that we have for CEOs in business. Uh, we hold it every third Wednesday. In fact, we just had it, uh, you know, yesterday. Uh, you know, but it's usually the third Wednesday of every month where we bring CEOs together. We've been doing this for the last, uh, what now, it's eight years, uh, to encourage people who are doing it the right way because they need a support system. It's not easy, certainly. But secondly, this forum helped us to also identify the standards. Uh, we borrowed, again, we give credit to a group in South Africa called an Unashamedly Ethical. We borrowed some of their standards. Uh, they gave us permission to work with them. And as we discuss those, we discuss each one of them. For example, something as, that sounds as simple as paying workers fairly. That is a statement. What does that mean? Because the, the neighbor next door could be paying a third of what I'm paying and they're, <laughs> they're getting away with a lot of profit <laughs> when I, I am not and so on. So we worked around those statements. So that, that's how we developed our standards. 
today and it's on the LNET website lnetkenya.org you can see now the 15 standards for leaders who are ethical and 15 now, so unfortunately we had to move from 10 to 15 no, right. maybe, we have, we, maybe, maybe we have maybe we need more challenge <laughs> we have more challenges <laughs> <Yes>. here <laughs> south africa had 10 we have 15 15 yes. for leaders 15 for businesses mm -hmm. so out of that came a process now and out of that is why we developed an hour tool to carry out now it's a perception survey i need to say because that's the only way you measure corruption or integrity it's, it's very hard to follow somebody 24 hours, 7 and so on yeah. so it's a perception but this the importance of this is that this perception is not just from people within the business we talk to customers we talk to their suppliers we most importantly talk to their competitors mm -hmm. so for example if it's fazu we'll look for other business uh, other ceos in in, in 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 the banking sector for engineer mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we have to look for other people in the petroleum industry mm -hmm. and related industries and uh, we don't give the award unless even the competitors agree the pass mark is also very high it's 80 percent uh, I know universities are associated with different universities and I know the pass mark is 40%. Mm -hmm. Ours is 80%. Mm -hmm. So we want to show people that it is possible to rise to that. Uh, professor here talked about the ideal mm -hmm. of being an ethical leader in our context, mm -hmm. even though we, we recognize it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So this journey has helped us to clarify this and now to grow this ethical pool. Mm -hmm. So we believe that by, by doing this, we'll be able to encourage them and so on. It's not easy. It doesn't mean that they are perfect. Mm -hmm. In fact, none of them has ever attained 100%. Mm -hmm. So they all have ways to grow. Yes. And we also make the process restorative. Mm -hmm. I think this is important because we knew that, of course, people would be afraid in case hey, this assessment maybe then will damage me and my business because it will show I'm not ethical. No, we never talk to the world about it until the day you are successful. That's when we do the awards. Okay. Uh, so we, we, um, there, there are companies that could not attain it in the first year. In fact, mm -hmm. we journeyed with them for, some one of them, we journeyed with them for mm -hmm. two, two, three years mm -hmm. until they were ready. And uh, when we did the re reassessment, now this time around the, the indicators were up, we were very happy to award them right. and grow this. So we believe it's a journey, it's a process, it's not a quick fix, mm -hmm. but I think if we continue to do this as a society, I think we'll begin to change the narrative. Uh, I think I would also challenge, you know, now that I'm in a media house, mm -hmm. I think media needs to help us. Yeah. If I had a chance to change that, <laughs> <laughs> because you give too much airtime to somebody who is corrupt. Hang on to that and thought. Very little. Hang on to that thought. <laughs> not, not that I'm trying to move away from the subject, Thank but you. I'm going to come back to it. Engagement. We have defined ethics. I'm going to ask them to just go around and just, in a sentence, just quickly, let's wrap it up. How do you define ethics? But again, how do you define ethics in your, in your various spheres of life? Feel free to interact with us on our social media platforms at uh, AM Live NTV, hashtag AM Live NTV also at Lab and Cliff at NTV Kenya. Of course, we'll want to uh, sample some of your views and you can also uh, dial in. But uh, in case you missed the first uh, half of the discussion, we're going back to it again. So, gents, uh, we're going to go into, uh, in one sentence, just defining ethics. Just quickly, and then we can take a round and then we can move on to some stories. I define it uh, simply as uh, doing the right thing at the right time, in the right way, for the right reason. All right, great. Prof? I see it as asking hard questions about your values, giving honest and public answers, and living by them. And if you do, you have integrity. All right, Fazel? I think, um, you know, it's working hard, making sure you're doing the right thing, and um, not only benefiting yourself, but benefiting society. All right. It's acting fairly in all you do, so that you are fair to others, doing unto them what you would wish them to do to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You all did very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, in Kenya, we're, we're told we're perhaps we may be too verbose yeah. in definitions, and I'm happy that that, for anyone who's watching right now, early in the morning, they can actually pick that really quickly, yeah. even as they go about their day-to-day -day duties. Yeah. So now that we've defined ethics, we really looked at even we have ethics inculcated in our constitution. We have ethics inculcated in, in of course, the good book, the Quran, the Bible, mm -hmm. and also in uh, the, the schools. We have Prof here, who's actually visiting all the way from Australia and Oxford, and is coming here to actually inculcate it in our students, and with also the work that you're doing at, uh, at LNET. Mm -hmm. But let's look at how do we actually apply it uh, practically, mm -hmm. yeah? This week has been very interesting, I should mm -hmm. say, I should say uh, in, in various aspects. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at how the society is. For anyone watching, perhaps, they might think, that, why is this society going to the dogs? Mm -hmm. um, we are going to start with a story that, of course, uh, came in from uh, Thicker Road. If you're watching this online and perhaps you do not know what happened, mm -hmm. is that 50 million shillings was lost uh, through uh, a tunnel that was dug right through uh, a stall all the way mm -hmm. into a bank. And uh, people were just questioning themselves, how exactly did this happen? Mm -hmm. But uh, before I ask my... Uh, uh, panelists mm -hmm. right here in the studio to just really uh, quickly comment on that. Let's take a listen into what exactly happened at uh, Thicker Road KCB branch. 
The crime scene has been attracting locals who have been streaming in to see this building, baffled by what happened here. The shops had been closed as investigators tried to piece together what really happened, but today the shop owners opened their doors for business. This is the building that is next to KCB Bank here in Thika. Now, the bank robbers had rented three stores here. In total, there are 14 in just this area alone, in this entire building. So the first stall is this one. Nothing really out of the ordinary, just a normal shelf and some uh, carton boxes, some sockets on the wall and a cable. It was normal. Now, this is where they were keeping their papers and their books and using this stall as a store. And they paid 12,000 shillings per month just for this one stall alone. Now, the second stall and the third one, this is where they were digging the hole from. Behind this cover is where they were doing all this. During the day, uh, the businessmen here say that it was covered the way it is right now. So the second stall and the third stall were covered during the day. And at night, that's when they were doing their digging. The doors to the three stalls they had rented are padlocked for now, but on the inside, their secret activities reveal a daring but meticulous plan that didn't raise any suspicions, even from the shop owners just a few feet from their stalls. The hole leading to the tunnel was dug from here. It is the same place where they were taking out the soil and using sacks and cotton boxes to move them out of the stall. Shop owners in this building have told NTV that they used to see boxes with labels written Handle with Care being ferried out, but no one suspected they were carrying soil. The reason they managed to conceal their activities very well was because, on the outside, the two stalls they had rented were well covered, and it appeared they were running a print shop as well as selling school exercise books and stationery. The first shop was the one that was used as a cover with books on shelves and a printer, during the day, this is the business they were doing. The five young men paid 12,000 shillings for the first stall, 10,000 shillings for the second, and 8,000 shillings for the third stall every month for six months starting June 2017. A shop owner in the building has told NTV they were very young, not more than 30 years, and very friendly. This area has been a crime scene for a few days now, but business has resumed. Everything now looks normal. but. Outside KCB Bank, on this wall, um, it's worth noting that there's no CCTV camera, so it makes it difficult to track the activities that were going on on this side of the wall because this is where there's interest. Now, across on this side is where the bank robbers dug a tunnel. From inside the stall on this building, the tunnel came through this way, underground, and this particular spot is where they said the tunnel uh, went through from this particular point all the way to this side of the bank. Now, they believe that the strong room was behind the ATM, so the tunnel went underground, straight to where the strong room is, inside the bank. They fooled the caretaker of the building that they always had printing jobs at night, and that's when most of the digging was done. <laughs> Investigators are still pursuing more suspects, and they believe they have good leads, but as sources told NTV, they're not ruling out an inside job. Dennis Okari, NTV. Wow, 50 million shillings through a tunnel. Uh, I think it's still baffling many, <laughs> you know, even this capacity and all. But uh, before we just come to the discussion, Safari Com has asked, uh, that's uh, Chala Communications, to refund more than 10 million shillings uh, that was collected, that's uh, through uh, KCP results uh, system shortcode. Now, the mobile service provider says that 424,000 texts to the shortcode meant to deliver the KCP results, but did not get anything. Hence, they needed for them to get the refunds. Now, Chala Communications, Communications, however, says it is Safaricom which should refund the money because uh, the third party does not collect the cash. Andrew Cheng has more details. Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, mine now. Immediately after the KCPE results were announced, parents, guardians and teachers who wanted to get results of their candidates quickly were supposed to send a text message to the number 22252. For many who were using Safaricom, however, the results did not come, yet the system had already taken up their 25 shillings charged for the service. Safaricom says there are 424,011 of such cases where, because of a technical hitch, many users had to send the texts severally and each time they were charged. And with each text charged at 25 shillings, 10.6 million shillings in excess charges was collected. 
Safaricom says that it's not its fault. The mobile service provider says the 22252 short code is run by a third party named Chala Communications Limited who is licensed by the Communications Authority and was contracted by the Kenya National Examinations Council to provide the service. Safaricom says it has instructed Chala Communications to refund all of the affected customers starting Thursday afternoon. But Chala has absolved itself of blame. The company says it cannot refund the money because it is Safaricom that collects all the payments and not the short code service provider. The company also says that it is investigating how the technical hitch occurred and why it affected only Safaricom because texts sent from other mobile service providers were getting the KCP results immediately. Andrew Ochieng, NTV. Well, the coded theft and the grand haste. I, I cannot take this further, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think they are sad situations. You know, I think that's the first thing I would say. It's, it's sad to see this that we have bent this law as a country. Um, I think part of it is, and this is important, um, I've actually had this, so I must give credit to Engineer Angelo, in terms of how we define success. Uh, because in this country, success is all about money. And the more you have, it doesn't matter how you get it. We think you are successful, you are prosperous, and so on. And sometimes even, um, you know, those who should know better, whether it's in education, whether it's in religion, and so on, we tend to you know, almost deify, you know, money and so on. So I think that's one of the things we must deal with, that uh, a good life is not about just having lots of money. It's about having an inner purpose. It's about making contribution, like for Suze, to society. It is about leaving a legacy. You know, those things have lost their value. And I think until we return value to those things, it's going to be very difficult. So briefly, I would say, I think I see that need to redefine what is successful. And secondly, I would say that maybe, of course, is the kind of values that we have as a society. So we need to move away from money as the only value to now more important things like contentment. Because there's never going to be enough. There's always going to be more. There are always going to be people with more money than you. But you can be content, fulfilled, and making a contribution, you know, and so on. Uh, values like integrity, of course, that was mentioned by Professor here, and also accountability. Right. So I think those kind of things will help us. Yeah. Uh, but thirdly, and finally, maybe enforcement. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking some of these are regulators, there are mm -hmm. people in business. Surely there must be regulators in those industries mm -hmm. that need to do that. They need to crack the wheel. Yeah. I think we do too much talking yeah. and very little acting. I think that's, that's what I would say. Prof, I'm not trying to scare you. <laughs> <laughs> Your money is safe if perhaps you uh, bank with KCB or maybe you've used the Mpesa platform. But I'm just, uh, what, what comes to your mind when you, when, you, when you listen to such stories and, uh, you know, uh, even as uh, you're visiting, I'm sure? Yes, um, obviously, I, this is the first time I've heard these fascinating stories. That, uh, the first ones, of course, might seem to be innovative and agile <laughs> and, uh, and entrepreneurial. Although what struck me, this, this sounded awfully like a cross between uh, a POW escape story, uh, either, the pro or either the wooden horse or, yeah. The, uh, yeah. or the great escape, and a couple of heist movies. I was trying to remember the one that was almost identical with this, mm -hmm. uh, where somebody was doing some repairs uh -huh. uh, to, uh, to place next to a bank. Uh -huh. And so actually they're not so innovative after all. Uh -huh. uh, and it makes you wonder, of course, the thing is that um, if you've got an exemplar out there in the, in the uh -huh. movies, now uh -huh. maybe it's it's, uh, maybe we shouldn't sort of uh, show people how to do it. But on the other <laughs> hand, uh, why you'd think that if you've seen it on the movies, if you see understand the risk, and this is for corruption risk, and this is just straight out crime risk, uh, you need to identify risks and deal with them. Because that's one thing in talking mm -hmm. about levels of corruption. Mm -hmm. Often it's very difficult to measure levels of corruption. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't have to prove there's corruption before you deal with it. Uh, in business, you're used to the idea of risk analysis, is that if there is a risk and that it's a significant probability and a significant effect, then you must address it. And so whether it's sort of looking at corruption risk, you don't wait for it to be proven. You actually uh, try to understand the risk, to, uh, prepare to, to, to mitigate the risk, to reduce the probability, reduce the effect. That's what you do, and that's what we need as governments. And I'm not sure about whether, whether, whether banks need to sort of think about heist movies, but mm -hmm. uh, if the robbers are, then maybe you should as well. <laughs> on the second one, yeah. uh, on, the on the results, it's interesting. They're arguing the money's, the money's been transferred. Presumably the money's somewhere. <laughs> it's either yeah. with, the, with the provider yeah. or with Safaricom. Mm -hmm. And my simple thing is we've had some 
much bigger figures, $80 million was stolen from a, um, uh, by a, a, a scam from, a, from a, uh, an insurance company. And the simple thing was that, well, the money, most of them, $79 million was actually in a, in a, was being paid to, to a bank. Uh, and the simple thing was to just return it to where it should be. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a question, of course, of uh, whether somebody's uh, breached uh, criminal law or regulatory law and you deal with that as well. The first thing is just give the money back. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. But well, I just, uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, and you know, you know, what are some of the measures you put in place? I mean, how do you walk out uh, 50 million? And uh, I just want to, you know, of course, not speaking of KCB, mm -hmm. I need to clarify that. You're just giving us an overview of being in the banking sector. Mm -hmm. You know, could these brains perhaps be used? I, I was even talking to somebody that perhaps maybe you should even hire this kind of <laughs> person who actually even thought about just going in through and just trying to uh, use those brains. Yeah. You know, it's one thing um, Engineer Njeru says, which is critical, um, your people side. I mean, you've got to get people that belong and believe that they own the company as well. So that, that fairness thing must come in. But in terms of um, you know, what, what banks are doing to, to, to protect uh, depositors' funds, to protect its, its business, I mean, there's a number of things that we, we're involved in. And, uh, you know, through the association, through the CBK, the regulations are there. Um, but this heist or this uh, underground tunneling or this great escape or what, what <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's also civil society, vigilance of civil society. Now, you have three stores and, okay, probably they were clever enough to hire three stores. Mm. But uh, the one across them could have heard something. Mm. Um, the, um, you could say that the night guard was um, part of the, the, the team, but I don't think so. And, and, uh, but, you know, some suspicious activities should be reported. So maybe, again, society, are we, are we, in the right, uh, are we, are we doing the right things at the right time? Are we reporting these, these activities? I mean, you cannot break a concrete slab without somebody hearing. I mean, it's, it's not possible. Um, the other thing is that, um, again, if... You know, they're not ruling out um, staff within the organization that uh, on inside job, as they call it. Uh, but, um, you know, people are, I mean, um, I'm not going to call them thieves, but um, people that do these crimes are very clever. And the question that you ask, should we not be employing them? In bigger banks, you have ethical hackers. Mm -hmm. we, we employ people mm -hmm. uh, full time to break through systems, to go and check how or where the areas are that, you know, we probably, there's an oversight because if you do the things every day, you, 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 you can't see the wood from the trees. So you bring other people in to break through the systems. So I think um, we, we spend a lot of money and I think it's costing the industry tremendously, uh, tremendous amounts of money, uh, which I think we can deploy in, in other aspects of, of society. Uh, the only thing that we, I, I think anywhere in the world and, and probably Prof, and I think if Tim, if they've done any research on this, mm. how do you stop collusion? When people get together, mm. and if you the judge, jury, and executioner, it is very difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's always a battle for us businesses, not only in banking sector, but I think in all businesses. Uh, uh, you know, be it the Safaricom exercise, be it the uh, even in, uh, engineers in Jeru's business. Mm -hmm. If people collude, they, they will adulterate his fuel. They will take his money. They will do something. So mm -hmm. I think again. Um, it's a culture that we want to bring into the organization, those kind of changes that people that we employ must belong Great. Um, to, to the organization. All right, thanks. Engineer Jerry, why uh, also when you look at such cases is that the, 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 the growing form of uh, maybe corruption and maybe theft is, 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 just, is really growing more technical. And I see you have an iPhone here. I think you're digitally compliant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's that, you know, they're talking about hackers. I mean, these are systems perhaps maybe uh, men in your age who will not perhaps be able to crack really quickly. So it's, I would say, mainly perhaps with, with the youth. Mm. In your mentorship, in your talks to young people, I don't know what, what are some of the issues that you mentioned because I mean, the tech is indeed, I should say, are the millennials or mm. people my age? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> one of the things that we find in a country like ours here in Kenya is the question of social values. We have come through many years. When I was in school, you know, when I was graduating in university in the 80s, it was not common to think of cheating in the exam as a, pr a process we are planning on so that we can go through the exam. 
by the time we were having the rules reorganized two years ago, people were rioting so that they can be around to cheat. <laughs> now, we have come through a system mm -hmm. where people believe, mm -hmm. socially, mm -hmm. if you make money in whichever way, it's all right. And I think that is the root cause of the problem. Unfair gain, you know, the, the, Bible, talk, the Bible talks of the, the love of money is the root cause of all manner of evil. Money is sweet, money is good, but must it be gained unfairly? And this is where it comes. If you are given a contract to deliver something and you are expecting to deliver by the one who gave you the contract, the feeling that if I do not deliver, it doesn't matter, I think is a main problem. Mm -hmm. And if I make money and people think I'm rich, I am okay, even if it was through killing a person or two in order to get to where I, I wanted to go. And I think uh, the big deal here is the social values. Moving on from social values. You want to put a question? Yeah, yeah. add on that. And yes. I, and, and I always say this, mm -hmm. um, and wherever I came from, wherever in the world, we have enough for our need. We do not have enough for our greed. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. the... And I think that's, that's great. The, you just kind of repeat that again. So we have enough, we have enough for what for we our need, need, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because to survive, we have yeah. enough. Because that's oh, given. Agreed. Yes. God has given us mm. things for us to survive, and that's enough for our need. But we do not have enough for our greed. And when the greed takes over, yeah. these are the kind yeah. of activities yeah. starts to happen. There's wow. another similar thing sure. that I like to say, and that is that uh, when people compare themselves, people tend to be much more often to be upwardly envious mm -hmm. than downwardly grateful. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, if, if you have that, if you have that, have, have that attitude. Yeah. The other thing is actually you want to be in a society in which others uh, are more or less equal to yourselves in, uh, in, in capacity so they can live fulfilling lives. But just don't be upwardly envious, be downwardly thankful. No, right. Gentlemen, ethics is not really about just looking at you know, what's happening uh, wrong, I should say, uh, in the bank space or in the telecommunication space or in the private sector. It's also about just embracing leadership. And uh, earlier today, of course, we are a few days away to the swearing in of uh, President Ruru Kenyatta. That's uh, on Tuesday. And uh, preparations are ongoing. And uh, of course, we'll be playing those clips shortly. But I want to show you some pictures here where the president actually chaired an economic summit that was, uh, I think, uh, yes, day before yesterday. And we had uh, uh, him, of course, walking over to National Treasury buildings. There you go. And you can actually see uh, him just talking to uh, very, uh, there's our members of the public there, of course, with his uh, security. Those were pictures there and walked into the National Treasury. And he was there, of course, uh, being awaited for by his uh, cabinet secretary. Uh, we had uh, different representatives from McKinsey. We had different representatives from AFDB, mm -hmm. uh, different principal secretaries. And, of course, his head of public services, uh, Joseph Kinua, and uh, the cabinet secretary of Treasury. As you can see that uh, mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, uh, Henry and teach indeed. <laughs> yes. So anyway, that was just, um, mm. uh, this is this is now at the top of uh, leadership. Okay. Many people have looked at these pictures and said, okay, where were the women here? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, we're going to come into that. But um, I just want to get to you, to your field. Mm. The, the country is now getting, of course, into uh, a healing process. We're trying to really uh, get on or move on to uh, the past that we had. Of course, it's been a very tense electioneering period. Um, there's just that those pictures kind of brought in some sense mm. of you know teamwork and some mm. you know collaboration into mm. forging the country forward, especially yeah. in the economy that has, has has really struggled of late. So looking at when you're talking about leadership and when you're seeing uh, such images, what comes to mind? Um, I, th I think it's a positive step. Certainly, we need to change the narrative. We've been in electioneering for too long, but. I, th I think on the other hand, um, to realize that uh, even as we look at the economic fundamentals, again, I would come back and we were talking a bit about this earlier, that uh, we possibly have a lot of the hardware right. We have institutions, we have commissions, and so on. I think what we do, shouldn't lose sight of is, is the software. Do we have the software to take us there? Vision 2030 is a great vision. But uh, are we working hard on the values that will make us a different people? Because we have defined what Kenya needs to be like. Have we defined how Kenyans need to be like? Because I think it will take a change of mindset. So I would hope that as they look at this, uh, you know, the economic fundamentals I think are very important. It's also important to look at how do we move Kenyans? Because we cannot become a prosperous nation with the same kind of thinking. You know, that old statement, the, you know, the, the thinking that got into a problem is not the same one that, that will take you out. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to work on that. So, and uh, I see other aspects that would need to be related. Of course, is high accountability. We voted in our new 
administration, so to speak, for the next five years, whether at the local level, the county level, or the national level, I think it behoves Kenyans to also hold leaders to account. Mm -hmm. It's a proven statement that uh, every government or institution runs better with higher accountability. Okay. So I'd hope that we would have more Kenyans engaging, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, asking the hard questions like Prof said, and uh, many who are seeking answers, but especially maybe the culture around mm -hmm. which uh, we begin to work with so that uh, we redefine success, we define who is a good Kenyan, who is a successful Kenyan. I think this needs to go hand in hand with the economic side of things. That's uh, Prof, my take. Mr. Sachin, we're just the executive, of course, yeah, getting yeah. down to business ahead. <laughs> yes, I think that I think the comments have been made several times, of course, mm. is that you do have uh, actually a very good constitution, mm. which uh, deals with, uh, which creates a, a large number of, uh, of institutions and a large number of laws. But one thing, when I uh, travel to developing countries and people say to me often, uh, we've got a problem here, because I'm a lawyer as well as an ethicist, uh, uh, and uh, well, what rules are you going to write? And as if the answer is to keep on writing more rules, sometimes whether they're legal rules, sometimes whether they're ethical rules and ethical norms. But it's not just about writing it down, as you say. It's, uh, it's, it's the software, it's the creating the institutions. And I think that, uh, that that's, that's what's really necessary to do. There's a good framework. Uh, but I think that there are, and it's been in Kenya, I've had a lot of people have said, you know, what more rules for me? You've got all the rules you need. Uh, what you want to do is to create institutions and inculcate people with the relevant values, uh, the ethical norms, and that they see also that their purpose in life as an individual and their purpose as being part of that institution is to live up to the promises of that institution and live up to the promises of uh, 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 that, that, that Kenya is, uh, is, is hoping for. Before I bring you further, you bring something very important, the purpose in life. And so people don't understand purpose. Mm -hmm. We don't understand what exactly mm -hmm. um, you know, they're in the world for. Yeah, I think that's important. And I mean, a couple of times you've, you've said that uh, people think just, just making money mm -hmm. as a purpose. Well, the uh, strange thing is, of course, is that uh, a, money, uh, a life lived just to earn money is a life that is ultimately uh, will fail because when you when you die you can't take it with you the only thing that remains is people's memories of you mm -hmm. and you live on either as an exemplar of mm -hmm. what a what a what a good person who lived their life to the to, to, with good purpose or what an old uh, fall out a word uh, mm -hmm. that person was isn't it good that he is dead mm -hmm. so I think that <laughs> it's not about it's not about money but I think the purpose might be different. It's, and that's one thing, when I talk about asking hard questions about your values, it's not that everybody has to have the same, the same, the same values. They can have similar ones, but uh, they'll, they have a purpose in life, the values that they want to fulfil and that they should feel fulfilled, they should feel a, a good person if they are following, achieving their values mm -hmm. as opposed to some external one, especially something as ephemeral as money. All right, great. Fazel, um, yeah. when you see the executive meeting, I know for you, <laughs> the business community will be a bit tense. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, forging forward, you know, from what next week, so I mean, what comes to mind? I, I think from, um, if I could speak on behalf of the business community, I mm -hmm. think we, we welcome this, this, um, this development. I think we, whatever the new normal is, at least we, we're getting somewhere. I think um, the country suffered uh, over the last few, few months, I think, uh, significantly. And um, it's not only businesses that are suffering, it's, um, it's a normal, normal man in the street. Uh, it's really becoming hard. So we're quite happy. We think, um, you know, Kenyans now have to roll up the sleeves and uh, let's get this country going. And I, and I believe this is the powerhouse of East Africa. And, um, you know, if we don't do right, we're not only letting ourselves down, but we're letting our neighbours and there's millions of people that depend on this country. Mm -hmm. That's great. Speaking of neighbours, actually, um, team, I hope you did not have to travel all the way to South Africa and left Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Tanzania. <laughs> Is it that they do not have any ethical standards you could borrow from? <laughs> there was nothing published. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, we are looking for something yeah. published well, that, and, uh, that we could start from. Yes. All right. That's, yeah. uh, maybe now we are, say we are first then in East Africa in terms no, of just embracing I would standards. hope so. I would hope so. Indeed. Yeah. Engineer Pitinger, um, politics on the side, uh, what, what, what comes to your mind? Yeah, I think I... I would just comment on the economic economic uh, meeting yesterday by uh, the president. I I noticed that one of the questions you're asking is where were the women? In the <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say that um, I'm impressed that as a country, I think we have come a long way. Mm -hmm. 
yesterday's meeting may not have had many or 30 percent women in that particular meeting i'll, I'll, I'll be bushed for that because even <laughs> right now we do not have a 30 percent representation <laughs> and, and, I would, and, and i would like to say that i think registering everything and putting everything in law is one thing implementing is another for example how do you elect 30% MPs. You can't tell certain people to be electing only women and the other group only men. In uh, appointments, when you look at that meeting, I think we have to look at it wholesale in terms of the departments, mm -hmm. the number of people who are not in the meeting but who work in the organization. Yeah. And when I think of it now, in retrospect, we have now more governors, mm -hmm. more senators, more women MPs. People have accepted women leadership as whole counties, whole communities, companies are led by CEOs who are women. So we are moving forward. We are moving forward. <laughs> yeah. I'm not to that. And I know because you're a father of daughters. And uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's something that is very <laughs> critical uh, for you. Yeah. But of course, uh, uh, we had uh, CS Cecil Karuki was not represented there, CS uh, Amina Mohammed. So indeed, the cabinet will have women. Yeah. But to our viewers, you all noticed during the results announcements, um, there's this, of course, tag that we ran, and it was all about the rise and rise of girls. Mm -hmm. So where are the boys? And of course, that is something that is quite critical, and I, I promised my partner to do it, because even as we define ethics, we've mm -hmm. defined ethics, we moved in from the private sector, gone into government, but ethics also inculcates into family. So where's the boy child? Take a listen to the story. From Chumo Educational Center, a diminutive preteen is celebrating her good results in this year's KCPE examinations. 12-year-old Mary Okuthe shared the third position in the country with two other candidates. I would like to be an electrical engineer because I see engineering is a great occupation. She joined that now exclusive club of girls who outshone boys in this year's examinations. In the results released yesterday, she, alongside seven other girls, took up eight of the top ten slots nationally. Indeed, out of the top 100 pupils, it was the girls who took the 50 plus one share, a break from the past where boys have dominated. The same situation was seen in several regions in the country. In Western, where the top pupil hails from, the entire top five slots were occupied by girls. In Nairobi and Rift Valley, girls took four out of the five top positions. The domination of girls in this year's KCPE has been attributed to a number of factors, chief amongst them an increase in the number of girls who sat the examination. Indeed, the number of girls taking the exam has been steadily increasing over the years. This year alone, 26,000 more girls sat the examinations as opposed to 20, as opposed to 25,000 more boys when compared to last year's numbers. We have more or less acquired gender parity at about 50.1 to 49 point uh, something that's near 50. So we are like 50% uh, of the students are uh, females, 50% are uh, males. Eh? And that alone is a major factor. In, in determining how the number of girls that are, are seen to perform are there because in the yester years uh, the ratios were much, much less. Numbers aside, the deliberate and calculated efforts by different players in the education sector to empower the girl child are said to have a direct impact on the good showing of the girl child in the national examinations. The girl child has been the talk of town. Government policies, NGOs, families tended to have uh, fingered the girl child to ensure that the girl child was empowered. And this empowerment, when we now come to the working class uh, uh, section of this economy, means that uh, the parents tend to keep their eyes on the girls because the girls are the receptacles. Nowhere is this best exemplified than by the performance of girls in Korea. For decades, this area has been in the grip of female genital mutilation, a practice that has denied girls a chance to pursue even basic education. This time round, the top performing pupils have been girls. This time round, we have shown men that we are able and we are capable. So it will be an example to them that we can do it. <laughs> Tunaona faraja sana.
But with the rise of the girl child, concern is being raised about the fate of the boy child who stands the danger of being left behind. In terms of benefits, especially in the, in the poorer uh, section of this economy, because we have, we, we have targeted the girl child all along, maybe it is time to remember that there is also a boy child that should, at the very worst, be treated in the same manner as the female. For now, though, the girls will be hoping that the same good fortunes they currently enjoy at the primary school level will translate to both the secondary and university level and eventually spill over into the workplace. Brenda Wanga, NTV. Indeed, congratulations uh, to the girls. This story must make you very impressed, sir. It does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, just let's talk, uh, of course, uh, congratulations. I think for as a father of daughters, I think uh, what goes into your mind, especially you see, uh, is actually kind of that acclimation, especially uh, to the girl child, before we move in to where the boys are not there. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I would say that as a father of daughters, I must say that uh, when I grew up, I was uh, one brother among... Uh, five siblings, we, and boys were born later, some other two boys were born later. But as I grew up, I discovered that my parents, who are much o quite old now, uh, believed that all children are the same, equal. So when my first two children were girls, I decided two, two children were enough children, and that was it. They are good fighters. One did law, one did engineering, oh. and they survive well. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should so much emphasize about uh, girls and boys, but about equality between the two gender. Because you can't have a world of many boys without many girls. We can't have a world of men without women. And uh, every sector requires both gender. For that reason, I think I would say the emphasis on promoting the the completeness and the value of the girl child has paid off. Let's now focus on the equality of pushing both together because okay. we need both. Indeed, we need <laughs> both. <laughs> and you mentioned equality is kind of the critical element in that. Yeah. But Fazal, um, the thing is, you know, with all the ladies scooping up the top uh, eight positions and what, of course, Professor John Mangua said there that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, just change the narrative a bit so that we do not forget the boy child. Even as we still acclaim, yeah. acclaim the girls, we don't forget the boys. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we still have the old thought processes that uh, boys are superior. And it, this comes from ancient times that, um, you know, society regarded uh, the boy child as more valuable than the girl child. And it just reminds me, and I mean, one of this in, in, the, in the Holy Quran, the scriptures, um, the equality of women, of girls, has been enunciated. It is the only book that I know of that has dedicated a full chapter on the woman. So, uh, you know, from that time you could see that the equality is there. Um, so, f for me, I, I mean, I also have a, a daughter and a, and a son. I thought I treated them equally as uh, much as I could. <laughs> um, so, where's the boy child? And I mean, I think there's a lot of things. And if you look at uh, Kenya today and, um, and, and what's happening in the political and economic uh, sector, um, maybe the girl child is being taken care of more of by the parents and more protected and so they could uh, utilize um, their times I think more productively in, in education and that's why you kind of see these results. Um, when you see on TV what's happening in terms of um, demonstrations and stuff like you, I think you'll see more boy childs coming in there. And maybe... Perhaps they're frustrated a lot maybe. Um, that could be and I, and I think um, um, Maybe they were not paying enough uh, attention to, to the real thing, that, but they had to. Uh, and I'm not making excuses, really. I don't think uh, girls are less smarter than boys. I think they're smart. Yeah. Um, and I think um, you know, some of those factors uh, could, could be the reasons for, 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 for boy child. Also, I think you know, my experience as well, um, uh, coming from South Africa uh, and looking at the frustration of youth, uh, you know, in, in, in a transition society, um, you'd find males getting more active uh, because it's very agitating for, for young, young males coming into society and you're bumping your head uh, for economic freedom and you can see there's nothing happening for you. Um, and, that, and that, I think, also distracts uh, some of the academia uh, that, that, that boys will go through. But there's no excuse. I think, uh, you know, now, now that I'm older and the wiser, <laughs> I, sh I should have done uh, as much as the girls 
are doing today. All right, uh, Professor. Um, uh, I'm also a father of a uh, son and, uh, and a daughter. Uh, I was just wondering whether you're actually going to accuse our first, first panellist of having a conflict of interest in this because <laughs> he had uh, three daughters, uh, whereas we, of course, have got, uh, have got uh, sort of more balanced yeah, no interests. Yeah. Uh, a couple of thoughts. Actually, firstly, Australia has sort of gone through this, I think, probably a bit earlier than, than you have. Certainly when I went, when I went through to... When, when, when I went to university uh, at the, um, the high-prestige... Uh, Courses. Uh, there are a lot more, a lot more boys. By the time I was foundation dean of law, two thirds of the uh, entrants uh, were were women, and they uh, and they did better throughout the throughout the course. But I want to say the thing is, there are a lot of other obstacles that they're going to face. You know, when they do go, when when they're in a competitive examination, uh, that it's a number on the top of the paper and somebody somebody marks it. Uh, but we've still got experiences where women's groups have have actually put in identical CVs, one with a boy's name, one with a girl's name, everything identical into law firms, and the one the boy is the one that gets 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 the interview. And even more later on in life, the thing is that. Um, uh, I think that I said when I was first, first, first married um, that the most sexist thing in our society is that most of the most interesting jobs are constructed on the assumption of the supported male. The image of somebody who's a CEO or a professor or a dean or whatever is uh, that it's a man uh, and that somebody, not only do they not, you know, not have somebody to share the housework with, but actually it's all done by somebody else. And uh, sometimes, of course, things this means there are house husbands for successful, successful women. But I think that, that, that there are a lot of obstacles they're, go, they're, they're going to face. Back to sort of how you address it with the boys, though. Uh, it was interesting that when my son first went to primary school, they are already talking about the possibility that, it, that boys should be educated separately uh, for the reverse of what they used to argue, that girls should be educated separately. They used to say girls should be educated separately because if the boys are in there, they're competitive, they'll lose, and the other thing is that it'll be interfered with sort of boy-girl relationships and that the women will do not as well. Actually, the principal of his primary school was actually arguing for boys' own education. I'm not sure about that. I actually think that there that uh, puberty affects uh, boys and girls in different in different ways, and I think that uh, in the in the development stages there does seem to be differences between boys and girls at that age, and you need to look particularly at the needs of each and how they inter how they interact. But the final thing I want to say, because we've been through some of these things that are girls more intelligent than boys and so forth, and there is uh, there was a uh, a much maligned. Uh, a British professor uh, called Hans Eysenck who actually said that he thought that he claimed that IQ of, uh, of uh, uh, black people was lower than that for, that, for, that for white. He was wrong and so forth. But the interesting thing is even it were true that one group, uh, one ethnic group, one racial group, one uh, gender group uh, was, you know, that there was, there, there were more, that, that, that there was a, a, a gap. It would still be that the uh, so if the best girls are up there and the best boys are up there and the worst girls are there and the worst boys are there, it still doesn't tell you anything about a particular boy or a particular girl uh, because the thing is that uh, there, are some, there, are, there are going to be some uh, girls who are much worse than most of the boys and vice versa. Uh, so I think this is a question of you, you take it out about these gross... Um, conclusions about uh, about just where boys and girls are and look at the needs of the students and the dynamics of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Great. I should mention, actually, <laughs> it's amazing that we talk about the boys that we have the National Leadership Forum coming up uh, on uh, the 7th of December. And, of course, the discussion there is looking at kind of the, the gender priorities and just how do we continue the conversation, especially among uh, men and women. That's going to be at the University of Nairobi um, on the 7th of December, just actually uh, next week. Um, Tim, I was thinking perhaps sure. in your awards, yeah. you should perhaps even have an award for fathers. Yeah. You know, raising an engineer <laughs> and a doctor is not easy. <laughs> and true. even have awards for the boy child yeah. and really you know, kind of, again, with what Engineer Jero says, sure. bringing that equality. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, let me own up, since everybody else has shared a bit about themselves. Oh, I'm sure, go I'm a father ahead. of two girls. Oh, great. Uh, mm -hmm. Who are doing well at university, both of them. And uh, so, in one sense, it's, 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 it's nice to see that girls now have a, an opportunity, maybe equal opportunity, to be able to rise to the top. But I think uh, we also are very cognizant of the fact that the society, as God designed it, is both men and women.
and so we cannot uh, uh, afford to, to, you know, for one to grow or improve at the expense of the other. I think it's a question of both. Um, whereas the women and girls have some contribution, great contribution to make to society, not only now, I was going to say like Fazul referred back to uh, the Holy Book, you know, in biblical times, there were women like Ruth and Esther. There are actually whole chapters, whole books that are dedicated to them uh, and their leadership because they contributed to society. So I believe that even in our context, um, you know, even within African settings, some, some, of, some of the communities have had women leaders, uh, you know, who were acknowledged as chiefs and, you know, and so on. So women have a contribution, but we need to keep the balance. Um, in terms of the awards that we give, we recognize family to be a very important foundation for ethical leadership. We actually, on the ethical leadership award that we give, we actually even do an assessment on the, on the family side. Uh, Engineer Angelo, since he has the ethical leader award, not only with, for the business, but also for himself as a leader, we actually got feedback from his spouse, from his wife, from his children, uh, from relatives and friends, because we believe you cannot be, you know, a saint out there, but you are a tyrant at home. Which yeah, is often the case <laughs> most of the time, you know, people, <laughs> that people is true. say that, oh my goodness, I'm not sure that's my dad, I'm not sure that's I know. my, you know. So I think that there's, there needs to be that harmony. So I think family for us is foundational because that's where values are, are, are developed and so on. And I think that the challenge for the boy child, I think, I think we are, if we are to, to, to make, bring this back right, is of course for those of us who are fathers then to play our role. There's a place of role, uh, role modeling first that, uh, you, know, you, you know, in terms of who is a good father, the father figure. And uh, that's an attractive figure. It's not a tyrant necessarily, <laughs> and so on. And then, also, of course, the place of mentoring. I realize that many people, again, would like to come make a contribution. So in fact, in, for us as Elnet, we realized if we are going to make a, an imprint and change our leadership culture, mentorship is a big deal. So we actually have a whole group within Elnet that just focuses on mentoring training. They've developed a manual and uh, helping adults, responsible adults who want to make, especially pass on values to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Because we realize we can't just leave it to chance, Indeed. that it somehow it might happen. Yeah. I think it needs to be some intentionality. Great. that we want to develop leaders, young people with the right values, and especially now, of course, we can focus on what we'll do uh, for the boy child so that they, they are growing in confidence and so on. It is a real issue right now. You go to primary school even, uh, you know, if you ask a question, the, the, the first few hands to go up will most likely be girls. So that whole need to, to, to inculcate confidence yeah. through good positive role, uh, role modeling and mentorship, I think would be important to, to bring this back uh, so that, uh, you know, whatever has happened over time, uh, some of it, I think, goes back to family structures and that have broken down. So, again, whatever we can do to fix those as a society. Great. And yeah. I'm happy that you all owned up that you're all fathers. So, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> and for you. owning up. Thank and you. And to your sons and daughters who are watching us, I think you should celebrate your daddies today. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to look at now, you know, how do we take it all from here? You yeah. know, just looking at, starting from defining at the, it's looking yeah. at, you know, leadership. And perhaps to a viewer watching this, it might be a bit too heavy. Yeah. You know? I just want to uh, uh, kind of draw to the closing remarks and I'm going to throw it over to you yeah. all to uh, finish and just kind of give us, just give a motivation to someone who's out there. Yeah. This idea of ethics and leadership is yeah. so new to them. Yeah. Uh, they don't have any idea. Let me start from Injit and Jerry. Yeah, I think in uh, thinking about what we have been discussing today and what those who may be watching us this, this morning may be thinking, one thing I would say is that hand work pays and encourage people that you can make money as an IT expert, as a trader, as a runner, as a politician. So the idea is do your role in the best way possible with what you have and the rest to follow, including good money, including success. Great. Fazal. Yeah, I'd like to echo what uh, Peter has just said. Uh, you know, my view is hard work never killed anyone. Um, and I think um, working hard also keeps the mind very occupied because, you know, idle mind is the devil's workshop. And that's where a lot of the mischievous thoughts start to come through. So uh, I think um, let's work hard, let's, let's build something. And I think when we build for others, we will benefit of, out of this. Great. Prof? We want to get a lot from you because <laughs> you fly out tomorrow, so um, feel free to wrap it up for us. There's a lot that I could say, but I think it's not a question of uh, giving an overall program. I think the first thing is actually having values discussions. 
uh, and talking about values and talking about ethics, but not actually forcing it down people's, people's throats, but to encourage it and to enable it in workplaces, in families. I, uh, I remember very well, in fact, that it's, you know, I'm a professor of law and ethics, but I never sort of rammed things down the children's children's throats. Uh, but one time uh, my daughter came to me, and she, I think she was about eight years old, and she said, Dad, we are so fortunate. You know, even in Australia is a fortunate nation, but in Australia we are very well off and listed all the things that, the things that we had. And he said, how on earth is that justified? And uh, I'm, not actually a, I'm not actually a Christian. I was brought up an Anglican. Uh, some people think that if you're brought up an Anglican, you can't ever be a lapsed Anglican because Anglicans don't believe anything and therefore you can't <laughs> lapse from it. But that aside, the thing is yeah. that uh, I, I actually told her the parable of the talents. Mm -hmm. uh, and each of us have different talents that we're given, some more of something, some less of others. And it's what you make of it. But not what you make of it for yourself, but what you make of it for others. And she still tells this story uh, in her workplace. And I think that it's really important to encourage values discussion, not ram it down people's throats. Although some of what I said about asking hard questions about your values and getting leadership to get that going, but to try and get it going in, in informal settings as well as the formal ones. So that people think about it and they think about what are their values? What are we here for? What do I have uh, that I can contribute to this society? Coming back to that thing about to use your talents just for yourself is not just selfish but ultimately, um, uh, ultimately self-defeating. And to really think, uh, what are my values? How can I realise it? Realise those values for others as well as for my family and my, my company. To encourage that discussion informally. And then when we formally say as the CEO of a corporation, well, what are our values? Why are we, what are we here for? How do we actually make money in ways that benefit the community? People will be ready for that discussion and will be prepared to not only contribute to it, but to commit to its realisation. All right, great. Tim, wrap it up Thank for you. us. I think ethics is first of all beneficial. I think as you say, sometimes people are scared when you go into that space. But actually it's a, it's a means to a happy life. Because uh, for example, you don't have to have a very sharp memory to remember what the last lie you told so that you don't repeat it, you know? That's a good one, <laughs> so yeah. you are at ease, you are relaxed because uh, what you said is yesterday is what you'd say today. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I think it's a means to happiness, you know? And I think we need to see it that way. And I think society is beginning to shift so that ethical people are not people to be, you know, you keep a, a bit of distance from them. I think there are people to be celebrated, um, you know, at the individual level, at the family level, at society level, at the institutional level. Um, in fact, now, if you don't mind me, I'll bring back my media question, sure. which is... Um, <laughs> Go ahead. I know you don't want to take it away. It's just fine. And <laughs> I think it's, uh, because media is a window to society. At least society. we have started. This is, no, no, this very, is a, very good. I'm, this I'm very thankful a, for this. Thank yes. you for 20 TV yes. for taking a, a lead in this. But I think in terms of celebrating the right people, I think we, we give too much airspace. If you watch our news, basically, it's almost 80% talking about thieves and people who, steal, who, who are murderers and doing this and the other. Very little space is given to celebrating people doing it the right way. I think over time, if we don't care for as a society, we become a negative society. People also begin to believe it's not possible to do the right thing. I think we need to celebrate more. Mm -hmm. If I had my way, I would encourage every media society to have a segment every day mm -hmm. where you look for somebody who is doing the right thing. Could be Mama Mboga, could be somebody in you know, a Juakali or whatever, or Juakazi these days, <laughs> you know, who's doing the right thing and yes, just sir. celebrate them. Yes.